All right. Uh, really appreciate everyone making it here today. Uh, it was disorienting just walking down from the garage. So I, I don't know how far people had to, to come, but you know, even, even a block uh, was a lot. So thank, thanks for coming in. Uh, ben Garber, right now I run corporate development for MedExpress, which is the largest uh, national urgent care uh, company in the country. We're owned by United Health Group. So no appointment, walk in, see a doctor. So I run our mergers and acquisitions as well as joint ventures, both with uh, other businesses and hospital systems. And I also run new product and service development. A uh, couple examples being, we've just launched a new uh, line of wellness products and a specialty pharmaceutical infusion business that's now up and running in Florida, Indiana, and New Jersey. Uh, before that, I worked for a single family office private equity firm, uh, buying and turning around distressed industrial companies Steel plants, concrete companies, manufacturers, oil and gas, stuff like that, heavy asset base work. Uh, we also had a venture portfolio. So I managed our venture uh, investments. I'd sit on the boards, lead the rounds, um, work with the companies to grow. Primarily focused on enterprise tech on uh, the mid-Atlantic up and down the East Coast was kind of where my network is. I'm a tepper. I, MBA from 2011. I had done some venture diligence and financial work for some high net worths and angels here in town. That's kind of how I got into it and transitioned out of uh, environmental engineering, which is my original background uh, working for the nuclear industry. So that's how I got here today. I've worked with uh, companies of all different shapes and sizes and in all different industries and uh, on the investor side as well. Pooling capital uh, among family offices, putting together club deals. I've worked on rounds as large as um, 200 million and as small as 200,000. Generally, the principles are all the same. Uh, and what we're gonna cover today is applicable to companies of all sizes, but I'm gonna tailor it to you know the needs of what you guys are focused on today. So if you don't mind, if, if we could just go around the room real quick, say who, who you are and what you're hoping to get out today, I'd appreciate it. Okay, great. Yeah, ho hoping to work at a startup. You know, probably like startup like in the future, but like not right now. So oh. Like some okay. <laughs> Nimbus. Uh, yeah. back anyone I'm looking at you thanks for attending today is there anything specific that you'd like to get out of the talk or anything you'd like to tell us about yourself Absolutely. We'll cover that. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Matthew. I'm a recent graduate student from Pitt in biomedical sciences, looking at potentially starting a startup here in the not too distant future around a cardiac technology. Okay. And starting to think about as as we start to look at very early stage pharmacology and toxicity studies, how we can be really intelligent about not only estimating those costs, but if it comes time to go speak to investors, how we can build in an appropriate market of 
safety for cost estimations for them and, and for us? Okay. Um, not going to hit so much on financial forecasting. Um, that absolutely uh, does play into the conversations I hope uh, you'll be able to have with investors um, through this, and it'll give you a sense. It ties into valuations as well. So we're going to touch a little bit on valuations, which are built off your financial forecast. And Dave Lachego just published a darn book on it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, Dave, I think it's financial modeling for startups. Uh, and, and Dave works at uh, Innovation Works. So it's part of CMU alum. Uh, also, a, a Woodland Hills alum as well. CMU alum. Innovation Works. Woody High, go Wolverines. Uh, All right, super, thank you. Absolutely. So that's really, so I'm learning as much as I can, um, and I'll be pitching soon. So. Super, yeah. Um, some of what I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about focuses on the role of the CEO, but also, you know, CEOs are very busy, uh, and this is work that uh, really entry-level business students can do for you also. So. Um, I've trained up interns to do this. I uh, give you some more bandwidth, you know, to empower you more as the CEO and prepare you for those conversations. Yeah. Hi everyone. My name is Asia. I'm a first year tech student, and I'm focusing on an idea in the travel media space. But I'm very early in the stages, so I'm just here being proactive and to learn. Super. And as a Tepper student, I, I always encourage. Our business students get to get paired up with our startups. You know, one of the questions we're, we're going to touch on today uh, is what can non-technical students do for startups? You know, that's a question I, I hear a lot. If I'm not an engineer, you know, we have some brilliant engineers in the room, but Carnegie Mellon is putting out a lot of very exciting startups. The business students want to get involved, but you know, Startups don't need CFOs, per se. Probably can't pay uh, biz dev people to go traveling all over the place. So how can you get involved and, and how can you help? This is one of the areas that, that we're going to cover. Anyone who's raising capital has heard dozens and dozens and dozens of times from investors, we're very excited about your company. It's just not a fit for us right now. So what we're going to focus on today is how to hear less of this. And it's pretty basic. Uh, this is a sales exercise. So we're going to talk about building a sales funnel. The product that you're selling uh, is your equity, is your company, or a debt instrument. But what you're selling is your company. And the principles are the same as any other sales process. So we're going to go over prospecting, qualifying, and then driving down the funnel so you can focus on the leads with the highest likelihood of conversion and how you reach out you know, to build that pipeline. So finding the right fit, you know, that's lead qualification. And why companies hire investment bankers. I have a mixed regard. Uh, for most of the investment banking industry. They do play a key role 
uh, in this funny section of the economy, which we all play in. Uh, they charge exorbitant fees that, like I said, a lot of the work can be done by interns and MBA students. So the very best investment bankers bring actual real relationships. The other 98% of them just hired the interns and MBA students. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, let's please keep it interactive. Don't be shy. Ask me any questions that, that you have as we go. I'm going to start with covering the tools that are available uh, to uh, Carnegie Mellon students. You pay for these as part of your tuition, so I uh, might as well get some use out of them, all right? Uh, they are not available to alumni, but uh, faculty spouses, yes. yes. Faculty spouses, yes. And uh, the method that I have used for eight years uh, since I graduated has been to bring on interns from CMU. Yeah, exactly. So in exchange for access to uh, these tools, I teach them how to use them, and it's a win-win. So. Exactly. 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 Uh, frankly, I did not learn any of this uh, through the coursework in the Tepper MBA program. I actually learned this from other students, uh, which is why I thought it was so important to put this material together. Um, and then, you know, since then, through experience, but you're not going to find a lot of this in the coursework. Uh, this is kind of stuff that's been passed on from student to student. Now, your your biggest resource that, that you're going to have, another thing that I didn't learn, you know, years until the, I was in the MBA, was there's an actual business librarian who will help you with this. It's, it's his job, and he's excited to do it. Ryan's normally here. He had another commitment today. Uh, he gave me a stack of his business cards. He would love for you to reach out to him and say, Ryan, I would like to use these hundreds of thousands of dollars of databases that I'm paying for. Please help me do it. And that's not a joke. I've had these after I lost university access, and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So use them while they're free. Ryan Splend is his name. Very nice guy. Reach out and say hi. You can find him in the Hunt Library. So some of the resources uh, that we're going to cover today uh, are available in the library, and others are available you know, just on the web. Uh, AngelList is always good for doing a little homework on any individual investor. Crunchbase, I, as they've more monetized their platform, uh, my opinion of its usability has gone down a little bit. Uh, it's not as accessible as it used to be, but you can sign up for a free trial or a 30-day pass of the Pro uh, for pretty cheap. So if you're already set up and you're ready to do your search, you can sign up for 30 days and then cancel your subscription. Uh, it's still a pretty good go-to access uh, for light information. Uh, PitchBook, not available here, just another example. Great user interface, and we'll touch on some of the SEC filings that are public uh, where you can get some information that is otherwise not normally disclosed. Um, the CMU databases that you have access to are absolutely excellent. And I generally bucket them in, into two different areas, ones that go broad and ones that go deep. Unfortunately, the ones that go deep uh, tend to not have great user interfaces. Uh, they have not changed in the over a decade that I've been using them. They must have a very comfortable position in the market, although PitchBook is eating up a lot of their lunch because of that. Uh, but really, really, really in-depth information. Um, 
So Market Line, CB Insights, Privco, Hoovers. I say help you go broad, and I always recommend starting broad. And then S&P Cap IQ and Thompson One uh, will help you go deep, and I'll explain a little bit more um, of what that difference is. But these are all available uh, in the library. Uh, you can also access them remotely. So that's something that's new this year, S&P Cap IQ used to only be on four computers in the library. You can now access it remotely through the VPN. I think the same uh, goes for Thompson One and uh, CB Insights. I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth uh, this year than I have in the past because there's been some pretty cool uh, upgrades, which is great for you all. Uh, the example company uh, that I'm gonna kinda ground this discussion in is a CMU startup. Uh, they've done two rounds of funding, I believe. Um, it's a, uh, a lingerie company uh, based in Garfield, started by Sophia Berman. Uh, absolutely fantastic entrepreneur uh, and wonderful person. So uh, this is their, their mission statement right here and their differentiator. Uh, There's some engineers and uh, Physics scientists who went into the lingerie industry, that's their differentiator. I, I just like some of their quotes that, that they have up here, you know, most comfortable bra I've ever worn, you know, hey sisters, come and get this. Uh, so this is their product in action and a little testimony just to give you an idea of the company that we're gonna be focusing on. But this applies to everyone. Uh, Sophia uh, is in the top left here, uh, all-woman team. Uh, just as a tip towards what will be a common theme of networking here, investors like to invest with other investors that they've invested with before. That can be a barrier to breaking in, you know. Uh, same goes for operators. So I was catching up with the Draper Triangle guys downtown recently, uh, found out that Bill, a uh, former Under Armour guy, who used to be the COO uh, for Thread International, which was a Draper portfolio company, uh, is now the CEO at Trust. Uh, he got in there through uh, the Draper connection, and now you know, I think they're being looked at um, for investment. So just to again, reiterate the point of, of these networks and how important the relationships are. CMU alum as well. CMU, Under Armour, <laughs> Trust. Okay, so. He's the CEO of the company now? He is, so I, I actually sent her an email last night to be like, hey, Sophia, what's up? We should catch up. I'm getting ready to give my presentation. I just heard this. So hopefully we'll be grabbing a coffee soon and I'll find out. But yeah, you know, all women founders, uh, I mean, Bill brings a lot of excellent experience, but yeah, you know, I'm hoping to catch up with her and get the story. Yeah, my, my understanding is, is she is uh, still there. And again, generally, and this is now speaking from an investor's perspective, um, CEOs come with different skill sets based on and appropriate skill sets for the size of the company. Some CEOs are great at taking things from a napkin to five, 10 million in revenue. It's a different skill set to then go from 10 to 50 million in revenue and another skill set to go from 50 to 250 and 500. So, you know, sometimes that transition is really what's best for both people. Um, and the founding uh, CEOs, once you get into the kind of boring minutia of some of the stuff we're covering today and handling investors and the uh, administrative side of running a business and you move farther away from the product and the customer, they say, hey, I want to get back to what I'm passionate about, 
which is usually product and customer, and you can bring in a more professional administrator. So that, that does happen sometimes. Uh, key steps that, that we're going to cover today, uh, and again, this is all part of the sales funnel, uh, is identifying comparable companies and their investors, and then back to that point about network, their co-investors. So this is prospecting. Um, the reason why we start with comps is because there's a gazillion investors out there. Where do you start? Well, you, you start by looking at comps because you know they're at least interested in companies that are semi-relatable to you in your situation. Making contact, how we reach out, and being prepared, what materials uh, you should have, and kind of what are those steps. So going to focus primarily uh, on the first bullet here, and then items two and three can be more discussion-based. Uh, we can do some Q&A there. So uh, first, you know, what is a comparable company? Again, you start looking at comparable companies because it's a signal that these investors are focusing on your area. Uh, you wouldn't want to go pitch a lingerie company to someone that only invests in robotics, for example. So the key areas to willow down the entire universe of all possible companies into what is a comparable company are your industry, your target market. So you know a lot of investors have deep market knowledge, they have deep connections, so they may be less uh, concerned about you know, what industry you're selling uh, or what, you know, what your technology is or what your product is as far as who you're selling it to because that's where their connections are and that's where they can add value. Company stage uh, is another way that investors are uh, categorized. So some investors by mandate uh, will only invest in seed, series A, growth or very large rounds. Um, others deviate. Uh, much to the chagrin of their limited partners. Uh, most recently, I, was, uh, I, I, I also serve as an LP um, for a fund that invests in venture capital funds, and I was looking at a healthcare technology company, uh, and I was going through their old deals, and I, uh, I saw that they had invested in POGS. Does anyone remember POGS, the milk caps? POGS, Eli, I know you remember POGS. POGS still exist? So yeah, that's, that's an example of uh, general partner drift away from your mandate. Not sure why a healthcare technology company, you know, fund invested in POGS. Um, Plymouth Ventures out of Rhode Island, uh, also supposed to be a tech investor. Early deal of theirs was Narragansett Brewing. I asked those guys, hey, your tech investors, Narragansett Brewing. Tell me how that fits with your mandate. Uh, at least those guys were honest, and they said, we were just starting out, and we we're still kind of figuring things out. I said, okay, well, at least you're honest about it. Someone else could have you know, spun you a yarn there. So I appreciated that. Um, investment size, this applies in, in two areas. So one, for your company, how much money are you raising? The other side of that coin is how big of a check is the investor going to write? That's often a function of how big their fund is, um, many investors will invest in stages. It's common practice to hold three times your original investment for follow-on investments, uh, and those can scale. So I used to start with a smaller check uh, for more speculative companies. Uh, for growth companies, I would try to get in larger to preserve more of the pro rata capital pool for later on, and get in at a lower value because it was already a more established company. So thinking about how much money you're raising. You know, if you're only uh, raising a million bucks and you go to a large fund that by mandate and mechanics of their fund size can't write checks under five or 10 million bucks, you're not gonna be a right fit. And geography plays a part. Um, a lot of investors, uh, will not invest outside a given geography just because they want to maintain some minimal communication and contact with their portfolio companies. And to make that easy, they either you know, stick to the East Coast or West Coast. There are national firms, uh, but they'll have satellite offices. 
So geography plays a role. This also goes into international investments as well. But these are the general criteria uh, that you'll want to think about as far as you know, what constitutes a comparable company in the eyes of an investor. You know? So you can meet some of these, but if you don't meet all of them, you know, you're starting to stretch it. The absolute first step is to be reflective. Think about your own company and where you are. And characterize yourself you know, in these criteria. So develop your own profile. You know, what industry are you in? Who are you targeting? What stage of growth are you in? And how much money do you need? This touches on your financial forecasting. Um, and I'll also give you the tip, whatever you come up with, double or triple it. I also recommend starting broad. Cast a very broad net. Again, we're building a sales funnel. And the widest part of the funnel is the top. So if you start too narrow, you've already cut yourself out of a lot of conversations. So start broad and then willow it down. This is also often an iterative process where you can do a search and say, darn, I only came up with you know, 20 comparable companies that can only link me to 50 investors I can reach out to. Uh, that's just not enough. I might need to take a second pass and maybe water this down a little bit to maybe a little less comparable companies just to cast a broader net. Uh, when I go through this exercise, I ultimately end up bucketing things into most comparable, medium comparable, and then a bit of a stretch. Because at some point, you need a critical volume. You know, if you only end up with 10 people to reach out to and a common hit rate is only 3%, uh, your expected number of investors is going to be zero. So you need a minimum number to reach out to. Yeah. Great advice. Well, it, I mean, it's it's a function of how much time you have, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, you don't want to waste anyone's time, and you absolutely don't want to develop a reputation for wasting people's time. So if you don't think it's a good match, don't waste someone's time. Uh, but if you do need practice. Uh, and maybe you're targeting lower level angels or another way uh, to break this up are lead investors and follow on investors uh, for any given round. You know, another thing that people hear a lot is, I will be happy to write you a check as soon as someone else writes a check. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard that even before I've started. Yeah. I mean, that seems like the... Uh, I, you focus on finding your lead. You, you need a lead, you need an advocate. Some firms by mandate will not lead around. They don't write term sheets. They won't so do it. Something we can research too, the companies that yeah, yeah, and, and the good ones make that very clear. Um, often in the press releases and in these databases, they'll say that the round, the round was led by so-and-so. Also in the press releases, uh, the lead of the round is the only one who gets to have their blurb in there. So after any um, investment, there's usually a press release. The company says, oh, we're so excited to grow, uh, and we're so excited to partner with so-and-so. The lead investor gets to say, oh, we're so excited to partner with this company. And then usually, if there was a broker or investment banker involved, they'll say, we're so good at our jobs. We're so glad that we were able to bring these people together to create value. <laughs> so you can look for things like that. Um, also, when I get to the uh, SEC filings, the leads are usually the names that you'll find on there. Uh, other investors sometimes will show up as chose not to disclose. So that's something to watch for. Um, but you can start with investors who do not lead rounds because uh, the stakes are a little lower. Uh, but again, it's a function of, of your time. You know? So you'll probably have a higher chance of converting those investors once you have a lead, and I would recommend focusing on finding leads, because that's also where you're going to find the best fit, and those are the investors that should bring the most value, and you're really getting married to these people. 
and I, I mean that. So that's where I would focus your attention. Uh, the add-on investors, in some sense, are along for the ride uh, and will be more or less engaged. Uh, but your lead, you know, that really should be a real partnership, and I, and I really do mean that um, for the very best ones. And if there's any advice I could give anyone, uh, it would be do not enter into a partnership um, with someone that is a bad fit. I give two opposing pieces of ad advice on you know, the middle ground, and people ask me a lot. You know, I'm not sure it's a good fit. Uh, their expectations for what this company is gonna do doesn't really line up with my vision for the company, but they are offering me a big check. So, I mean, there's two opposing pieces of advice that I offer there. Always take the money. <laughs> Always take the money. If someone's offering you a check, I say take the money. The flip side of that, and I'm gonna contradict myself, is don't get in bed with someone uh, that you're not willing to get married to because it's not gonna work out well. And you really have to think long and hard about that. Uh, so where the cutoff is, and this is the best advice that I get from advisors like Dave, it's not who to invest with, it's who to avoid and who's a bad fit. So is someone a good fit? That can be a hard question to answer, uh, but you can usually get pretty good advice on who's a bad fit. And at least cutting them out should raise the quality of the rest of your pool. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, do you have any uh, feedback or it, or it, it depends. It depends on the firm. And if you're partnering with a corporate venture firm, uh, the support you're looking for should mirror that of, you know, will they provide support as a lead customer? And will they give you kind of preferential treatment that they wouldn't give to some other supplier to help develop you as a key customer? You know, usually there's some strategic intent as to why they're investing. Um, some venture groups, like BMW uh, Ventures, has completely gone away from making equity investments, and they only uh, develop these kind of preferential customer relationships, where they're your customer partner, they'll embed their engineers with you and help develop you because they see you as a key element either of their supply chain or their future development, and they realize that's really the best role for them to play. Um, other than that, though, it's really gonna come down to the partners in the actual venture firm, though. Great question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. But
I mean, a, a good example, uh, I can talk to United Health Group, which owns MedExpress, is launching an incubator powered by Techstars. They're based in Minneapolis, uh, which is where United Health Group uh, is based. They also have United Health Group Ventures, and Optum, which is the technology arm of United, has United Ventures. Um, United Health Group has a roadmap for the company and where they see the future of the market and where they see the future of the company and the capabilities and customers that they need to access to realize that. They also know their own company and they know what they're good at, what they have and what they don't have. So their venture groups will identify startups to incubate or invest in and then they shop them around to the appropriate parties within the broader enterprise as customer relationships to get them embedded and build them up. So that's, that's the real value uh, that they would bring compared to a purely financial investor. So it's really that preferential customer uh, relationship. Uh, kicking into the databases on what's available to you, a couple new things. So CB Insights is new. Uh, like I said, they're, they're great for starting to go broad. Uh, and very conveniently, they offer these industry reports. So with trust, uh, you know, you can very quickly, this is on their home page. This is right when you get in. This first thing you're gonna see. Uh, they have an online fashion industry report, covers trends, all the companies, and the investors who are covering them. Really, really broad, broad range of industries and topics uh, that they cover. This scrolls a long, a long way. Uh, one of them I noticed, just to demonstrate how broad the topics are, they have poop tech. <laughs> I thought that was a little funny. It actually turned out to mostly be around um, like cow farts and methane, so global warming stuff, which is it's, it's actually pretty good. But uh, you know, this demonstrates uh, it's a really easy tool to get a broad look at the industry and get some early leads as to where you should dig. A great comparison uh, uh, for this process is going down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. So you need to find some starting points and they're going to branch and they're going to branch and they're going to branch. And that's, that's what we're doing here. But you need some place to start. Uh, this is the online fashion uh, industry landscape. Uh, they put these together for each one of those industries. Uh, I was pretty excited to see that trust uh, is now on there. So that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, these are internationally published reports. People pay thousands of dollars for these. Uh, they're also listed as one of the uh, disruptors of Victoria's Secret. So that seemed pretty cool, you know, uh, getting some recognition there. Uh, they have a nifty search function. Again, all of these databases have strengths and weaknesses. That's why I recommend that you use several of them. They really work better in tandem. Uh, so you can search fashion industry. They'll have a whole list of investors who have made investments in the fashion industry. You can pair it. Uh, so you can then say fashion industry and upfront ventures. So you know, how many fashion investments has Upfront made for companies show up? Uh, pointing out a weakness in their own data sets. So again, these are, these are databases. These things are tagged. You're submitting queries. Um, if you now kind of go into their fashion industry and you sort by portfolio companies, Upfront Ventures now shows up with seven. So on the last search, it said four. Now it says seven. I'm just pointing out that these are databases and there are little quirky things like that. So you gotta dig around and again, cross-reference. But it is you know, pretty, uh, it's a pretty nifty and easy search tool. And again, it's easy for going broad. You know, these are your first uh, targets on your prospecting list. Uh, they have Dossiers, which are really you know, kind of company history overviews. Um, they have one for trust. You can see two investors, Innovation Works and Break Trail Ventures. Uh, so you might say, hey, my company uh, is a fashion company 
or I'm targeting a similar segment of you know, women in the marketplace, people who believe and trust potential may believe in my potential. Uh, maybe I should reach out to these break trail ventures folks. Uh, they have a profile. They seem pretty darn active. They've been making an investment every month towards the end of uh, 2018. Um, they're focused on seed, seed rounds. And you can see who they're co-investing with. Equally important. Another key piece of advice, so when, uh, when you hear, you know, I would love to invest, but it's not a right fit, you're either being fed some BS or they're sincere. And if they are sincere, you should ask for two references. Never leave any conversation with an investor without asking for at least two references. That's how you're going to expand your own network and get trusted referrals. So if they really are sincere, that they, they think you're a good company, just not a right fit, they should be willing to provide those references because they have a network. Uh, and that's kind of how VCs repay each other, you know, with good quality leads. Um, what VCs hate is when they send each other uh, less quality leads, which is a waste of everyone's time. So if it is a good relationship, uh, they'll pass you along if they think it's a good fit. D different investors don't invest for a whole number of reasons. They might not have uh, the right amount of dry powder left in their fund. A lot of VCs will stay on the market even when they don't have any money. That's really important to know. Um, it might be the wrong round. So coincidentally, you could have approached someone who only invests in Series A or B and you're raising a seed. They will have relationships with seed stage investors because that's where they get their pipeline from. So they might legitimately say, hey, uh, I would love to invest in you you know, after you get up to a million in revenue or you have a marquee anchor client, uh, go talk to this guy or lady who I have co-invested with several times. You know, they're farther upstream than I am. You'd be a better fit for them. And if things go well, I would love to be in the next round. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit. A lot of uh, this exercise also produces a comp table. So a comp table is a list of transactions with similar companies and what their valuations were. So then you have a basis to then approach an investor and substantiate why you think you're worth $5 million, $20 million. Uh, the investors will be armed with this information. And if you don't have it, you're really setting yourself up uh, for a lopsided negotiation. I've been in those same conversations with other investors on the secondary market or investors who are trying to bring you in on their rounds. Um, after LinkedIn went public, LinkedIn was on everyone's comp table. I didn't think it was appropriate, but it juiced everyone's valuations. So all of a sudden, you know, trust is comparable to LinkedIn, you know? So the same exercise that we're going through here uh, to build a prospecting list, it's the same exercise with the same tools that you would use to build a comp table. Uh, the only difference is that you'll also include valuation, which is usually tied to either revenue or earnings. Um, so you see Break Trail, you go to their website. Oddly enough, uh, there's nothing on the Break Trail website that actually identifies who works here and who the investor is. Um, unfortunately, this is not super uncommon. I don't like it. I know Dave doesn't like it. If you're out there in the market, say who you are, okay? Uh, but 
there are these nifty things on the uh, SEC website, which is called Edgar. It's searchable by company name or investor name. Uh, there's really two that you need to be aware of. We're gonna focus on the form D. The other one is called an S1, which ties back into valuations. Side note on that, when a public company acquires another company um, of meaningful impact, now that's, that's what they use to get away disclosing this information sometimes, they'll say it's not consequential. So if a huge company acquires a very tiny company, they'll say it's not consequential. If it is consequential, they're required to disclose uh, how that company would have impacted their prior year's financials, which will give you their revenue and income. And if you can tie that to what they got bought for, you now know what their valuation was. And you pull that from the S1. We're gonna focus on the form D though. Uh, cool thing I like about trust, the actual uh, corporate name of the company is Bazooka Jane. I just like, like the name. You see Sophia down here uh, as the executive and a director. Other information that is included uh, on this filing, uh, you can see that she's raising $2 million. Uh, she has sold 550,000 uh, of that. And the guy that bought it is named Jay Hirsch. And this is his address uh, in Westerville, Ohio. Jay Hirsch is Break Trail Ventures. So now you know who you're actually looking out to and he has a LinkedIn page and now, now you can get to him, see if you're connected and how to get there. So uh, if someone's not being you know, fully out there, you say, well, how do I find these people? You know, that's one of the things that we're talking about today. Uh, the Form D is very helpful in that. Uh, other important information, you should be qualifying these investors just as much as they're gonna be qualifying you. You've seen that Jay's pretty darn active. He's been making investment kind of every month. You know, hey Jay, what's going on here? Well, funds also file Form Ds because they raise money from limited partners, uh, which they also must disclose. Uh, so, I mean, for Jay, honestly, uh, I checked his LinkedIn page. Uh, oftentimes, these people will be listed as other directors. So, I had to amend this. This goes on pretty long, but there's related persons and principals. Uh, for Sophia, um, all of her other directors were listed. Usually, good firms will list who the partners are. And I'll have another example um, of that. So earlier on, we saw that Jay has co-invested in another women's uh, related company with uh, Harlem Capital. Uh, Henry was uh, the lead on that deal. On his LinkedIn page that I've covered up here, you'll see that he has listed that he's a board member on the company. He's much more transparent than Jay is kind of a better way to do it. Um, many venture firms will list their investment criteria on their website. Please, please, please read the investment criteria. Uh, if you reach out to a partner and they get the sense that you didn't even take the time to you know, read what they look for, uh, you're starting off on, on the wrong foot. And this will also, give you an idea of whether or not it's a good fit and whether you'd be wasting your time pursuing them as an investor. Um, Harlem Capital's pretty active. They're fairly transparent uh, about what they're doing. And they also tell you their check size, uh, they provide their email, and what information uh, they wanna hear from you if you reach out. So, uh, <coughs> You know, really, you know, upstanding and straightforward um, investors right here. These uh, gentlemen might be a better fit for you. And you now know, hey, I could get an introduction to them via Jay, via Sophia. Oh, 
Fantastic. Now you know two ways to get an introduction. We're networking. Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> Company experience. Fantastic. What other school? Yeah. So uh, other big, big, new, exciting uh, upgrade uh, that's happened to the databases. So this portion of my presentation used to be much longer. SMP Cap IQ uh, has now added this new feature called Find Investors. I was extremely excited to see that. Super cool. Uh, it used to be much more difficult. So this is a screening tool. You can see it's under their screening section. Uh, so again, um, CB Insights going broad, S&P Cap IQ going deep. This is a great tool for developing a comp table, which will help you with your valuations. Uh, very quickly, the way this uh, tool works is it's a series of screening criteria. So you know you're looking for investors. Um, they have an incredibly long list of industries and subcategories. So I'm looking for investors who invest in apparel, apparel retail specifically. Uh, you can add on. You know, again, like I said, it can be iterative. You want to go broad. If you don't get enough, you know, you may have to go broader. So maybe you add beauty care products, other companies that might target a similar customer segment. Uh, they let you organize by stage. So I can say, you know, I'm looking for seed stage, early and, and mid stage. Uh, the types of transactions you're going to be looking for if you're growing a startup or growth capital. Uh, these are more debt and private equity type options. And then uh, what I'd like to point out over here, so what I did was a search for uh, investors who are investing in comparable companies to Sophia's. And you can see it, I started out with 326,000 investors. And as I added these different screening criteria, I got down to 149 that are a good starting point. You know, 149 is a good starting point for a prospecting list of you know, people to reach out for. Um, once you dig into it, 149 might turn into 100, but 100 is still pretty good. If you end up closer down to 50, I'd repeat the exercise and build it up more. Because again, there's going to be a conversion rate. You know, you'll grow along the way through other references, if, as long as you're always asking for two references with each conversation that you get. But you want to start uh, as high as you can. Uh, other interesting uh, feature with S&P Cap IQ, so say you find uh, a comparable company. Uh, it has the buyers and investors, uh, all of them. The lead is listed first, but you can see who they've co-invested with. Often, if you map these, uh, again, you'll find that investors co-invest with the same co-investors over and over again, which is important to know. So uh, if you're mapping out a path to get somewhere you know, you're starting to put together this web of connections and you can identify your best entry point, you know. And that entry point may just be based on who you have access to. So if you have a classmate who happens to be, you know, at the Swartz talk that you're at, you know, that's your entry point. Um, so this is an absolutely fantastic tool. Uh, what this spits out is information that includes transaction size and often revenue as well. Ultimately, what you're trying to put together is a list like this. Uh, you can see my list is a little old, but general criteria you want to use are, is it an appropriate round? So if you're raising a Series A, uh, you, you know, this D is not really applicable, okay? I do not recommend going back any farther than five years on a search. You know, three years is most applicable. Don't go any farther back than five, again, Three, you might not get as many companies and investors as you want, so you'll look at four, look at five, don't go past five. Deal value, so how much money are you raising? You know, if you're looking in the, you know, $5 million ballpark, 
I'd say, you know, anything in here is appropriate. Uh, again, you know, 25 and 30 million dollars probably not actually applicable to the round that you're raising. But you now have a list that you built off the comparable companies that you identified, maybe using CV Insights as a starting point, uh, maybe using Crunchbase, and the um, lead investors on all their rounds. Uh, so that list specifically was put together using MarketLine. MarketLine is one of my favorite places to start. Terrible search feature. Uh, unlike CB Insights, you can't do ands, you can't use quotes, you can't uh, exclude words. It's just a general search. So you end up with a very large um, search result. So, you know, big, big pile. It's hard to narrow down. Um, but one of the things they return are financial transactions. And once you find a couple that you think are really comparable, uh, this is uh, my favorite, I, I, I call it a, a cheat code. So uh, when you go into market line and you find a, a transaction that seems like a good fit, they have a little page, you know, it tells you the information, it has the blurb, you know, from the investor and from the company. And then at the bottom there's a box called ask an analyst. And ask an analyst is what it sounds like. It's often an MBA sitting in, I think they're out of Chicago, uh, in an office in Chicago who will do the rest of this searching for you. It takes them about a week. And this is free for CMU students. This is free for CMU students. So even if you yourself were not successful in recruiting any wonderful MBAs to work with you, you at least know that there's some MBA, probably in a dark cubicle in a basement in Chicago, uh, whose job it is to do this. I recommend finding five comparable transactions that you think are a good fit. Each one comes with a reference number. Uh, so when you submit your Ask an Analyst, you say, hey analyst, I'm looking for all comparable transactions that are similar to these five, given the five reference codes, in North America that happened in the last five years. And I would like you to include revenue, earnings, and all you know, relevant valuation information. Please confirm that you've received my request at this email. Because once you hit submit, nothing happens. I can assure you that it actually does go there. Uh, I've gotten phone calls from these people saying, hey, I'm still working on it. Uh, this is a big search that you've asked me to do. But there is no confirmation, so I always include, please confirm that you've received my request by sending me an email. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, Tepper students, you're gonna blow your classmates out of the water. Uh, you're gonna be coming in with comp tables uh, that people are gonna be like, how, you know, how did you get all this information? How were you able to put it all together? Uh, and the answer is gonna be some kid in Chicago did it for you. So, you know, if you leave with little else, uh, the Ask an Analyst button from MarketLine uh, will produce this for you in about a week. And again, they'll send you a big long list. You go through it and you can bucket into most applicable, medium applicable, and a little bit of a stretch. And then, you know, others are non-applicable. Over here, what I'm not showing you on the spreadsheet is revenue, transaction size, earnings, who the advisors were, so that's another way to get these introductions. The way attorneys and accountants and advisors uh, develop social capital with their clients or prospective clients is making these introductions. You know, lawyers like to bring possible deals to their clients for them to work on. You know, it's making work for themselves. So this is a prospect list. Uh, it's also the start of a comp table. It's a very similar exercise. Uh, again, these things work best in tandem. Um, so if one of the companies on this list uh, that seemed you know, applicable to me, adore me, Moose Partners. Hey, Moose Partners, how do I know Moose Partners? Wait a minute. You know, let's look them up on, on Crunchbase. 
Uh, they seem pretty active. Um, I don't see it on here, but Moose recently came in to uh, Four Moms, which is downtown. Uh, they were brought in by Bain, so again, reiterating the point that investors co-invest with the same co-investors over and over again. Bain was the lead on Four Moms. They brought in Moose, which is the family office of the Chanel family, so this is their investment vehicle. Man. Who do I know around here uh, like who could introduce me to the four moms guys? Hey, Dave! All right, that's, that's the way this works, you know? I'm, I'm also an investor in four moms. Dave's an investor in four moms. Uh, so four moms partnered with Moose. Moose uh, is invested in Adore Me which seems like an applicable <laughs> comp. Oh, by the way, there was just a secondary, I'm just mentioning this, there was a secondary transaction, which means that one of the early round investors down here, um, their fund life was probably ending, so that's another important thing. It's not just how much money is left in a fund, it's where they are. Uh, if you're talking to an investor who's in year six of their fund, um, and you don't plan on exiting for five to 10 years, you're eventually going to run into a conflict. A lot of the weirdest transactions that I see are because the underlying investment fund you know, hit year 12 and the LPs wanted their money back and they had to sell the company uh, for whatever they could get for it, even if it wasn't the right time. So someone down here had to give their money back uh, and this Alexander Mars bought their shares. Um, I've been approached uh, many times to buy out existing shareholders on the secondary market. I came with cap tables to uh, tell them that their cap table with LinkedIn was a bunch of BS and that I thought the company was only worth like a quarter of what they were asking for. Again, importance of having the cap table. Um, but, you know, Alexander Mars, you now have another lead. You know, if he's buying shares and adore me, he probably won't show up on any of the other searches, but he's a viable target as well. Um, other fun things I just like to point out, you know, uh, that you get from these profiles. So again, uh, this is the Adore Me profile on Market Line. You can see who's invested, um, who are co-invested. Something I thought was funny. Uh, they used to be called the Webcam Generation. This company was founded in 2011. I guess webcams were cool in 2011. So I just thought that was funny. So, you know, neat things that, that you find on these profiles. Uh, again, back to, you know, who do you reach out to? You're not reaching out to a firm, you're reaching out to a partner. Uh, Upfront Ventures, you know, led the round in Adore Me. This is their crunch based profile. So, you know, pretty quickly you can see, hey, um, they have a lot of dough. They're pretty active. You know, maybe these are appropriate people to reach out to. A question I get a lot is, will a fund invest in a company that is too much like their other company? Um, that usually depends on fund size and how active they are. If you are a 500 startups or an upfront and you're investing in hundreds of companies, you will invest in very similar companies because you probably have a sector focus you are not going to invest in a direct competitor of an existing portfolio company, but you will invest in multiple companies that play in the same playground just because of sheer volume. If you're a smaller investor and you only have 15 companies uh, like Jay, you know, Jay, Jay's only gonna invest in 15 to 20 companies. Um, he's gonna need to diversify uh, and depending on what his mandate is, he might not want too much sector risk. So the answer to that often depends on fund size and investment volume. Um, on the competitor note, would you say to avoid funds that are invested in our direct competitors though? Yeah. Okay. Um,
Yes, I would. I, I was trying to think if, you know, there would be some competitor to your competitor that would make a good fit, but I honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so private equity firms often focus on complementary and integration and roll-ups. So that's a little different. Um, private equity companies absolutely will buy two identical companies and merge them together to instantly make a bigger company uh, because there's multiple arbitrage. So small companies generally trade for smaller amounts of money. Big companies trade for larger amounts of money. So just if you take a $100 million company and a $100 million company, you put them together, it's instantly the valuation goes up, not just by the factor of the 200, but you'll get, I'm just going to say, instead of a 8x multiple, you get a 10x multiple because of scale. And now these financiers uh, made a return without actually doing anything. So private equity is different. Uh, it's a different model than, than VC. PE guys will buy competitors and merge them together. Venture firms generally don't. Uh, so this is the Adore Me page on the upfront uh, website. Most venture firms will have a list of their portfolio. Uh, if they don't say who led the investment uh, on the company site, uh, in the bio of the partner, it will say which investments he's led. He or she, um, unfortunately, most often he. Uh, so again, you know, if they don't show it on the company page, you can get it uh, from the partner page. Or uh, like our other friends saw on their LinkedIn site, it'll say, I sit on the board of. You can figure it out that way. Or on the form D, they would be the name listed as a director of the company on the filing, not the other partner. Uh, Adore Me happens to be listed um, by trust as one of their competitors, so I'm just bringing that full circle. So uh, those are uh, the databases that are available to you. Uh, those are a couple different paths that we just walked down to navigate them to identify the actual people that you want to reach out to and how you can get those connections to reach out to them. So uh, from there, I'd like to go on to you know, actually making contact. Um, so I'll take a quick pause if anyone has any questions over what we just covered before moving on. Mm -hmm. So when you go and look at Edgman, is the best way to the SEC Ed Edgar tool, or is it a, a better tool for direct hiring? Uh, for exits, mm -hmm. S&P Cap IQ uh, is, is going to give you the, the best information. And again, that will feed into your comp table. Okay. Um, market line, ask an analyst also uh, will do that for you. And you may want to do them both at the same time. Again, I, I recommend uh, cross-referencing these and, and doing them in tandem. So hands down, uh, the absolute best way to make contact is with a warm introduction. Now, that's not always available, uh, but there is a hierarchy of warm introductions. Number one is co-investors. These people. Uh, have a demonstrated record of working together. They have strong relationships. They trust each other. They use each other to screen. Other investors in general, because they know, hey, you get it. Uh, industry leaders. So that's a good, good way in. So you're probably out there you know, meeting people in your industry, uh, either as customers, partners, mentors, uh, these people have developed a reputation, you know, that they know what they're doing, and they will often know investors either because they're high net worths themselves, or because their companies were invested in, or because they sit on boards. So if you don't know their co-investors co and can't, you know, get someone to make an introduction to someone who can make an introduction, or other investors, or your investors, which we'll get to, industry leaders are great. Uh, Cold calls actually work, uh, and, and we'll, we'll cover you know, the tact of doing that. CEOs are incredibly busy. 
Uh, often the number one job of CEOs is capital raising, but sometimes they also have to like run a company. Uh, so for situations like those, it's appropriate to hire an investment banker to do the work that we've talked about. They also will package up all of your company material into a very nice presentation and literally put together a sales pitch. Again, this is a sales process and investment bankers are salespeople. Um, I wanna hit on the responsibility of your existing investors, you know, if you're looking for follow-on, uh, as well as the CEO. Um, if someone's on your board and they are not, one, putting capital in your follow-on round, they shouldn't be on your board, and two, they should be bringing in other investors. If I get a call from a board member of a company saying, hey, you should come invest in this company I sit on, my first question is how much money are you putting in? And if they're not putting in money, doesn't mean that I won't look at it, but credibility has been diminished. Uh, if an investor comes to you or you're talking to an investor and they're offering to write a check, one of the questions you should be asking is who else can you bring in down the road? Uh, are you a one trick pony? Is this the last source of capital that you're gonna be able to bring in? Or are you going to make these introductions to downstream investors and other parties? Uh, because I'm gonna need more money later and you need to expand the pool. Um, one issue that we have in Pittsburgh, particularly in biotech and life sciences, is that A-Lung uh, and Cohera Medical and maybe one or two others have really tapped out the local investment base, you know? Um, Exactly. Exactly. So if, you know, an investor is only bringing you their pot of money and not their network, you got to think about it. Can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. So the main three CPO firms, or three days, PLSG, Biotech, Innovation Works to some degree, UPMC Enterprises to some degree, who else? And around, around this area in that space. Oof. So I, I was talking about the importance of your investor network, and if your board members aren't bringing in outside capital, then they shouldn't be board members. Yeah. Uh, and I said that an example of a problem, uh, if your investor is only bringing their pot of money and not a network of pots of money, and sometimes that network can be too interconnected, is how the biotech and life science community here is largely already tied up in A-Lung, Cohera, and maybe two others, um, and the, it's, it's tapped out. His question was, what other investors you know, are the best to target locally? Uh, he's focused on biotech, correct? A, a, a cardiovascular device? Eagle. Eagle Ventures, um, and that's a network of high net worth individuals that he keeps very private, so you're never going to let you know who they are, so it's hard to get to those people, but um, LifeX is the newest fund on, on the block. It's basically an incubator out of the University of Pittsburgh, coupled with a venture fund that's being raised to, to fund early stage companies, but they're not there yet. Um, you know, there's a way to go. Um, Pitt, Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse historically was a really good source of money, but they are out of money and they're just operating vice. Um, one, one new emerging organization that wasn't mentioned around the innovation works uh, different pockets of money is, is 99 Partners. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's uh, 99 Partners. It's, a, uh, it's an angel group of CMU of alums yeah, uh, uh, looking at investing in CMU-related companies. It doesn't have to be a CMU company. We're working really, really hard to bring venture capital here. So Jim Schwartz is uh, one of the greatest venture capitalists of all time. He founded Axel Partners, amongst many other incredibly successful investments. They invested in Facebook. They were the first uh, venture investor. So we 
we, we host venture capitalists here all the time. So the Schwartz Center can be a conduit to, to help startups here. So we help startups like Venture, the Lightnopolis, and you know, raise money because we know we have a network of investors that are not here uh, as well. We obviously know all the investors in town. So it's, it's, you know, Pittsburgh, despite all the great things happening, and there are a lot of great things, is capital poor. And it's a real issue for us. And And, and evidence from that, I, I think the last money into A-Lung was Allos, and they're out of Cincinnati. So, I mean, you have to keep reaching farther and farther. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Audrey's Kitchen. Audrey's Kitchen, which is his wife, and they make the decisions at the kitchen table. Uh, and, uh, uh, Jerry's daughter is actually running an Alicia McGinnis, so um, I don't think it's a field company appropriate or appropriate timing. It's certainly going to be some good issues for them as well. And can't speak more highly of uh, Mr. McGinnis and, and the legacy uh, that he's left. He mentored my mentors. so. He, he, Yeah. Uh, we have a competition here with this investment companies called the McGinnis Venture Competition, and, and it's named after Jerry. He moved out that, that competition. Yeah, great legacy that, that he's, he's left in Pittsburgh. I, I appreciate the, the side discussion, so thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, there's, 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 that's the thing. There's, there's a lot of things that are not sort of in your face uh, that the network can provide, and the network is the most important thing for building characters here. Absolutely. Um, so again, it is, you know, investors bring in a lot of things to you. One of those things has to be bringing in other investors and bringing in follow on capital. It's not just the round they signed up for. Uh, and if they want a board seat, you know, the price of that is buying in on future rounds and bringing in future money. And if they're not doing that for you, you really got to ask why they're sitting on your board and how invested are they really? Uh, but ultimately it comes down to the CEO. The CEO is the number one salesperson. It's your company. Uh, it's your equity. Uh, and everything always comes back to the CEO. Uh, but like I said, we've covered a few tools that will help you leverage some lower level labor uh, to give you a boost in doing that. Uh, now, being prepared and what you need to actually reach out to these people, especially if you're cold calling. So you now have your target list. As Dave just reiterated, help your network help you. So these are the people I'm trying to get. You know, does anyone know how I can make contact with these people? Leverage everyone you know, but at least you have a list to focus on. You know, that really helps. You know, you can go to Dave and say, hey Dave, I'm looking for an introduction to investors. That's helpful. Or you can say, hey, I'm looking for an introduction to Jane Smith. That's more helpful. Uh, if you're doing an, a cold reach out, have a personalized introduction with why you selected them as someone that you're reaching out. And you can reference back to your comp list. You say, hey, I saw you made this investment in this company. I'm similar in these ways. I read your website and what your investment mandate is. I match your criteria. This is why I'm a good fit. That's all appropriate for an intro letter. So I saw you make this investment. I match your criteria. I think it's worth us talking. Three documents to have. One is a one-page teaser uh, that is just a simple summary. You would send this with your intro, either attach it to an email or if you're actually sending a physical letter. Uh, but the, the one-pager, this is very common. This is actually how investment bankers start. Uh, they don't include a lot of proprietary information in it, and they will send it out to their entire email list. They will blast this thing all across the world and if they get any responses, that's one of the ways they build their target list, is who responded to this. I mean, it's not spam, it's a step up from spam for the investment bankers, but um, in a lot of industries, they, they think of it as spam. But have a one-page teaser, have a summary. What's your company? What are your traction metrics? How much money are you looking to raise? A little bit about you also. You know, who's the founding team? What's your product? One page, make it pretty. 
if they respond to that, have a short slide deck ready. Uh, if you think uh, your story is better communicated uh, through a written document, keep it short, uh, including addendums and pictures and tables and everything, not more than four pages. Three is probably better. You know, this is still early on. They're not going to do a lot of reading. But have your slide deck ready. That would be step two. If someone gets your intro, you have a phone call, they say, okay, the first request you're going to get is for your deck. So have your deck ready to go. Um, and lastly would be any sort of business plan and your diligence documents ready. So if you find someone who's interested, the last position you want to end up in is they're going to ask you for materials and you saying, hold on, please wait, I need to like go get organized and get my stuff together. So you'll want your um, incorporation documents, you know, you'll want the contact for your counsel and who you're working with, uh, you'll want your cash flow forecast or whatever your financial model is, uh, any, you know, appropriate information uh, related to uh, your product and, and development as well as uh, the plan and the pipeline. Customer information. Yep. Uh, yes, and the reason is um, LLCs pass tax liabilities on to their investors. Certain types of investment vehicles cannot accept tax liabilities because they're also LLCs, which then means they are sending tax liabilities back to their limited partners uh, who are like, why am I getting a, that's a K-1 filing that they would then have to file on their taxes. Uh, if a lot of firms were set up that way, their investors uh, would be submitting probably like hundreds of K-1s with their tax returns. Um, I'm sure the tax accountants would, would like that. Um, but that does have an impact. Um, you can transition. There's actually another Swartz series on uh, setting up your corporate entities and what's the best structure. Uh, but that is a, a consideration, and the tax flow back to the LPs, many of which are tax-exempt endowments, for example, um, is a reason why a lot of companies go with Delaware C Corps instead of LLCs. Uh, you can uh, mitigate your personal risk by you personally incorporating as an LLC and you being an investor in your own company. You can do it. I mean, I often do it right off the bat. You can. It's cheapish. I mean, you're you're gonna spend a thousand bucks, which uh, is both you know a meaningful amount of money. You don't want to throw away a thousand bucks, but at the same time, you know, it's a thousand it's a thousand bucks. So, it's not necessary. Uh, I. Yeah. I'd, I'd follow uh, your counsel, uh, your counsel's advice. I mean, often also I'm in the position where I'm spending other people's money. <laughs> That's more of a priority. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is what you're, you're going to want to have prepared. Again, uh, last situation you want is you, f you got someone in. And they say, all right, well, let's, let's dive in. You know, I'm, I'm ready, I'm excited, and let's go. You say, oh, well, I, hold on, I need to go get my stuff in order. What, what, what exactly is it that, that, that you want again? So if you're going to reach out uh, with a cold call or a cold email without a warm introduction, these are the materials you're going to want. And even with a warm introduction, they're going to ask for the same things. And that's it. Hey, thank you so much. I do appreciate you all sticking it out. I think I went long. Um, uh, but thanks for braving the cold, uh, sticking through, through the topic. Um, 
my contact information, is it on the website? Yeah, no, you you can put it up there. I uh, usually have it on the last slide. Um, again, I'm I'm a Carnegie Mellon alumni. I've uh, gotten so much out of the school. I'm happy to give back and uh, support our entrepreneurs. I think that's a great strength of this community. Um, I'd encourage you to do the same. Uh, but Please don't hesitate to reach out. Happy to you know, make any introductions that I can make uh, or you know, offer advice as appropriate. So thank you again all for, for showing up and sticking it out and braving the, the polar vortex.